All right, so we're, we will go ahead and get the started in our Sunday school class. Um, and uh, what do you guys think about the, the layout of the room? You think this will be good? You like it? Okay, one cool thing, that box right there has our whiteboard, our four foot by three foot whiteboard. It came in just last night, so I had a chance to put it together. But, uh, you know, next Sunday, I'm gonna probably have it here or somewhere, and we'll be, I'll be able to actually jot notes and Greek words and maps or whatever. You can see my artistic abilities. So you got the screen behind you too. You can use. I thought about that as well. <laughs> I bring a, you know, I can actually send my this right up there. So if we do have a real detailed map we want to look at or something, we can put it right up. So, with that said, we will go ahead and get into a word of prayer. As you heard, there are uh, a few others that are have been ill. Um, uh, Gary and Dr. Shaw, and I think uh, Buzz Payne and his wife, they they've been. They've been dealing with it. So let's keep them in prayer. And uh, uh, Barb Cooter is scheduled for hip replacement surgery the first part of October. It's the pain got to a point where it couldn't, she just couldn't handle it. So let's go ahead and uh, open a prayer before we get started. Father, we thank you so much for this time and we thank you for your word. And Lord, we just give you praise and glory that we can be here. And we ask that your Holy Spirit will come into this place, Father, that, uh, Lord, you will just speak and your spirit will reveal new truth about your word to us. Father, we pray for each person that is uh, dealing with illness right now. Father, we pray for your divine healing in their body, Father, that, that they will be made well. And Father, that we can fellowship with them again in the coming week, Lord. We thank you, we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right, so as you guys know, last week we left off in verse 7. Uh, and this is, um, <clears throat> this is right after Paul had this miraculous experience um, with the presence of Jesus speaking to him uh, in chapter 9. He's, he's on the road to Damascus uh, with a letter that is authorizing him to basically persecute Christians. I mean, that's what it's saying. You're allowed to identify them and arrest them because they believe in Jesus. And so Paul has this experience where Jesus uh, talks to him and appears to him. And uh, the men around him also heard this sound. And, and Paul's there on the ground. And that's where... That's where verse 8 picks up. So we're going to read verse 8 and we're going to talk about it some. Saul got up from the ground, but when, his, when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by hand into Damascus. So remember, we talked about just this condition that Paul must have been in at this time. The, first of all, the shock and, and the fear of what just happened, but also the realization that this person that he has been trying to wipe out of history, Jesus, all of it is true. Jesus is alive. Jesus is real. And uh, he is there and he's speaking with Paul. And so um, this deep realization and, and probably um, overwhelming, maybe even sorrow and conviction <clears throat> is probably falling on Paul. He gets up and, and now it's not just the emotional state of, oh, I can't believe this, but he, he comes to open his eyes and he's blind. And I, I mean, talk about a state of fear um, to suddenly be blinded while also dealing with this emotionally, I think has to be a, a low point. I mean, you think about the weight of these situations on him. And uh, <clears throat> so everything uh, he had been working for was wrong. Um, he can no longer see now. And the, the phrase that Luke uses to describe his blindness uh, are the words blepo odis. Blepo odis. And, and blepo uh, me has sort of a dual meaning. On one hand, it it means that it's literally you you don't have you've lost the the ability to perceive with your physical eyes 
blinded. Um, so it, it has that meaning, but it also, and this is where I think it, it is interesting that Luke could have, would have used this word. There are other words that he could have used um, to describe, other Greek words, to describe the, the act of being blinded, but he chose uh, blepo uh, odes. And here's where I think it's interesting. The definition, this secondary and actually probably more common definition would have said this. The ability to see with the mind's eye and to have the power of understanding to discern mentally and to observe, perceive, perceive, and discover what you're actually seeing. So the use of this phrase is talking about more than just a, uh, the fact that he had lost a physical ability, but that actually in his life there was, there was this blindness in spirit, if you want to look at it like that. He, he, even though he could see prior to this, he, had, he did not have the ability with his mind's eye to perceive and understand what was going on. And, uh, and I believe that, that Luke is really alluding and indicating the physical blindness is really not the blindness that he was living in. We know exactly what he's talking about. Every single one of us, um, every single one of us, when we look back upon our lives prior to coming to a relationship with Jesus Christ, what, what would we say? I was blind. I was blind. And of course, the, you know, the, the famous song, I was blind, but now I can see. And that is not talking about I was literally blind in my eyes and suddenly they were healed and now I can see what I'm looking at. Nothing to do with it. And I, I, I think the use of this word is Luke driving home the fact that Paul's real uh, realization here, the thing that he came to understand was all this time, this was the truth and I couldn't perceive it. I, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't know it. And now my physical condition is a reflection of my spiritual and emotional condition. And uh, Saul at this state was unable to do anything. I mean, mentally, I think, and emotionally, he's distraught. Physically, he literally can't see. Therefore, his companions who were with him led him into Damascus. Um, it's interesting to think about this. Saul apparently had instructed his companions to bring him into the city. Uh, in doing this, and I, I, this was sort of a, a rabbit trail in my mind I started thinking about. Um, in doing this, they were actually doing the will of the Lord, even though they may not have had any idea of what they were doing. I've taken this as a reminder that uh, God can use everyone and everything to bring about his purposes. He is the one that's in control. And oftentimes, you know, we, we look at individuals that disagree with what we believe or that are out um, stating and trying to do things that are totally in opposition to what God, who God is in his character. And yet I believe that God is working a plan, right? Every single step, God is working a plan to bring about his purpose and to reveal the truth. And everyone is going to bow and confess that he is Lord. This particular, uh, this particular story, by the way, God, just to show you the way God can speak through a, uh, his, his word to us and reveal truth. When Corey and I felt God was calling us to move to Salem, we had been praying, God, what, you know, where in Salem, what house do you want us to live in? And there were several and uh, that we were looking at, and he began to give us these little words, something somebody would say to us, you know, hey, I just wanted to tell you to look out for this or, you know, whatever. But one day we, we were reading and, and this verse suddenly, um, it was emphasized to us about Paul on the road to Damascus. And that's where he would 
you might, some of you might be thinking where I'm going right now. So, <clears throat> Corey and I live on Seacrest Road, about a, you know, mile from Damascus. So we're looking at these houses and suddenly we were driving and I'm literally ready to turn on the road and right there is Damascus. And God reminded us of this emphasis on the verse that right before we get into Damascus is where he wants us to be, where we can meet him. And we knew that that was the house that we were supposed to live in because it literally, as you're driving from Salem, it's as you approach Damascus. <laughs> And so it was such, it was just one of those awesome things like, God, you are so awesome. You're so cool, you know, that you communicate and give us uh, instruction. Anyways, a little side story. So verse nine here, we're going to, we're going to look at verse nine. Um, Paul is now in Damascus and verse nine tells us that for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Now, if, if we think about this condition he's in emotionally, mentally, now physically, and uh, he, he is probably in this distraught situation. And I know when I've gone through stuff in the past, the thought of food, I don't want to think of food. Like it's, it's this physical sorrow because you, you have such a weight. And it literally says that he did not eat or drink anything for three days he would have been in a very poor situation. Think about this. For three straight, straight days with no, you know, no um, practice, no endurance build up or anything, you just cut off your food and water supply for three days. There are many people that if you did that, they would actually, they die physically. I mean, their bodies could not handle that amount of, of time. And so, he, he probably had very little sleep. He was in this terrible situation. And we're going to find out later that we know that he was spending time in prayer as well. Um, we're going to read that in a couple of verses here. He, so he, he was this, I think, in these three days, if we could uh, if we could see if they had written a chapter about what he was experiencing and, and maybe the conversations that were taking place in his mind. Um, and, and things that were happening, I think it would be an amazing conversation to, 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 to get details on. And I think why is because we have all had that same conversation. When we came to realize Jesus is real, and suddenly we realized he, he wasn't here to condemn me, this, this feeling of love, acceptance, and forgiveness came over us. And it was like, I know for me, the next hours and days were just this amazing, amazing point in my life where I knew I'm, I'm like, I'm really built for a purpose, Jesus. Like, you really love me. You know me like that. And this, that was just flooding over me. And so here is Paul being described in that state for three days. And here, right after we have this description, so we know Paul's in Damascus, he's in this state of probably kind of repenting and, and you know, just coming to grips with what has happened. Luke switches gears and he starts to give us another end of this story that's taking place. And in verse 10, it says this, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. So we have a new player now in our story. Ananias is a resident of Damascus, as we read. And later in Acts chapter 22, verse 12, Paul gives us some more description about Ananias. He describes him like this in chapter 22, verse 12. He says, Ananias was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. Ananias was also, in addition to being this, um, you know, this faithful Jewish believer, he was clearly a follower of, you know, the, the way, as it was referred to uh, during this period of time in history. Uh, Luke's descri Luke describes that the Lord appeared to him in a vision. Uh, the Greek word that's translated here um, uh, as called. You notice some of the translations will say 
uh, he called him in a vision or instructed him in a vision. <clears throat> that, that called out is the Greek word lego, L-E-G-O. I mean, literally like our toys, lego. And uh, the definition of that word is to advise, command, or direct an action. So God had a very, Jesus had a very real purpose for appearing to him in this vision because he was giving him a direction. Um, uh, and, the, and the vision is horama, H-O-R-A-M-A. And it means this, a spectacle which can be gazed upon and which uh, is divinely granted in either a state of sleep or a state of of ecstasy. Um, so this, uh, the implication there is either uh, kind of like a dream, but not really a dream. God has spoken to me in, in dreams on multiple times. And I, I, I tend to dream often when I sleep. Uh, most of the time I wake up and I'm like, oh, babe, I had this crazy dream, you know, and uh, you know, whatever was going on. But there's something different when I know that God has given me a dream because it's not just this, this you know, dream. It's, it's truly more like a vision. It's vivid. I actually can smell the smell. I can see and sense the colors. And I know that this is God giving me something. Um, the other possibility here, the state of ecstasy. Ecstasy in, in the Greek here is defined I like this, an overwhelming feeling of great happiness or joyful, uh, a joyful excitement. And in this context, in, in the context of the New Testament, when we see this word used, that state is brought upon by the presence of the Lord. So this isn't, you know, we're not talking about a drug-induced state of ecstasy or, you know, you're, you're meditating and suddenly you feel all happy or whatever. This is talking about because the Lord's uh, manifest presence is near you, you are in this state of absolute contentment and joy. It's because of the presence of God. And, uh, and I think about times that, you know, I've been in, in uh, studying the Bible in a worship uh, setting, worshiping God, or in prayer, and suddenly, you know, um, it's like, oh, we're worshiping and everything's fine. But God just makes himself known to you in a new way. And it's suddenly like everything around you, everybody's singing all that, it fades out and it's just you and Jesus. And you, you know you're loved. And that that's the, that's sort of describes this state of ecstasy. So, um, you know, Ananias is probably there in his house. He's, he's meditating on, on uh, the scriptures. He's thinking about Jesus and what he has done. And here we see Jesus say, Ananias. And you notice there's an exclamation point behind that. This, uh, there's, in addition to the name in the Greek, there's this demonstrative pronoun that's added, ho, H-O. And it, it indicates a forcefulness with which a word is delivered. Like you're meaning business if you, if you have this uh, uh, ho behind it. Ananias ho. And um, it, it literally is translated kind of as an exclamation point in English. It means that you are driving this home. And uh, Ananias responded to the voice. And I think it's important that we take note of the way that he responded to his voice. Um, the literal translation is, here I am, Lord. Here I am. Uh, now, if we contrast this, I want to take uh, a second to contrast this with verse 5 uh, in Acts 9. Remember what happened. Last week we talked about it. When Saul heard the voice of Jesus, what did he say? Who are you, Lord? He didn't know that voice. He didn't know the voice. And, and yet we see Ananias 
immediately say, yes, Lord, here I am. And he knew, think about this for a second, he knew the voice of his shepherd. There was no doubt, here I am, Lord. There was no question in his mind. There was no fear or apprehension of what was taking place. It kind of reminded me, um, back all the way at the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 10. I'm going to read it real quick. Uh, he answered, I heard you, he being Adam. Uh, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. I heard you, but I was afraid. Ananias here demonstrates none of that fear. And why? I think this is why. Because he had been cleansed by the blood of Jesus and could therefore respond with confidence because there was nothing separating him and the Lord anymore. The veil was torn. He was clean. He was in fellowship with Jesus, with God. He was in the presence of the Lord. What a, what a, I mean, that's an awesome realization for us today. That when, when God calls on us, we don't have to run and hide and say, I was in fear because of my sin, because of the separation. When Jesus says, when Jesus calls our name and, and he, he, he says, come, we can just go. There's no, there's no shame. There's no guilt. It's been thrown away. It's been paid for. That's, I think, powerful. And I think we see a demonstration of that in the contrast between the way Saul, someone who did not know Jesus, versus Ananias, someone who did. It's a wonderful blessing and privilege, I believe. So here's, here's Ananias having said, here I am, Lord. And in verse 11 and 12, uh, the Lord begins to give Ananias the instruction as to what he is calling him to do. We're going to read verse 11 and 12 together and then talk about them. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Wow, that, that's some specific direction. You know, that's, we talked last week about how, uh, you know, Jesus had told Saul to go into Damascus and there's no GPS, there's no, uh, you know, uh, map to guide him or even name. But here we see how specific God can be. We, in a lot of ways, have the ultimate GPS, not just about where we're driving, but about our life. It's the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he is the ultimate GPS. If we're in tune with the Holy Spirit and, uh, you know, we're walking through, pray for that person over there. You know, help pay for that person's meal. Call that person and tell them that Jesus loves them. Same way we're driving down the road and the GPS says, make a right onto Wooddale Drive. You know what I mean? If we're in tune with the Holy Spirit, He becomes our guide through our life. He tells us where to go, what to do, who to commune with, when to commune with them, what to say to them. We just need to be in tune. Just like Ananias, when he heard that voice, bam, that's my Lord, and I'm going to do what He says. Doesn't mean we're not going to struggle, and Ananias has some of that. <laughs> and we're going to read about that next week. So, Ananias uh, was told to go to a house on Straight Street. Now, Straight Street, and this is a little bit of history here about it. This is a real, I mean, this is a legitimate place. Uh, it was built by the Greeks uh, after the city of Damascus came under the rule of Alexander the Great, about you know, 300 some years prior to this. Um, during the time of the Romans, Straight Street had been widened, it had been improved, and it, it was really probably the, the primary uh, road in, in Damascus. It was like the main thoroughfare. Like if you think up in Salem, you know, right there um, by Heggie's, you know, 62 goes right through it. 
that's sort of that main street and then you got the, the main that goes off that that's what straight street was it's where the business happened it's where the people congregated it's where the all the vendors brought their goods straight street was was the center of all the action and by the way straight street exists still today in damascus it's literally there in fact you can still see uh stones and stuff that are probably stones laid by the, the greeks and the romans this is a historical place um, so uh, the Lord gave additional instructions to Ananias, um, not just to go to Straight Street, but somewhere on Straight Street, apparently a man named Judas lives. It's certainly not Judas, uh, you know, uh, uh, from the original 12 disciples, obviously. Um, but uh, a man named Judas uh, lived there. And uh, Jesus had told Saul earlier, now this was Jesus giving, telling Saul what he, or I'm telling, telling Ananias what he had told Saul. So Ananias had the full picture. Like, not only are you going to go there, but I've actually already told this person that you are going to be waiting for them there. You're going to meet them there. And, and uh, instructions on what to do. Um, and apparently, we can also deduce from this that there had been additional conversations between Jesus and Saul as well. Notice, notice what this verse says. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him. So um, up in the original conversation that happened between Paul and or I'm sorry, Saul and Jesus, he just says, get up and go into the city and you'll be told what to do. After arriving in, in Damascus, we can now kind of deduce that Paul then must have received additional vision, additional instruction, additional communication from Jesus showing him this step-by-step -step GPS uh, you know, navigation on where he is supposed to be. And... <coughs> Um, he gives insight uh, to, to what had been taking place with Saul, too, that his, his sight needed to be restored. And it was Ananias that was going to do it. Now, we also, that same description of restoration of sight, it has the same implication as what we talked about before. We're not talking about only um, a surface physical healing. Like he's been blinded and, and you're going to restore his ability to see. There's a deeper meaning in the definition here. It's that you are going to open his mind's eye to the full revelation of who Jesus is. He is going to see the world differently because he is now going to know Jesus. And I think during these three days, Jesus is preparing Saul for this time when his eyes were going to be opened because he, he is and he's encountering Jesus right now and we and again we are, we've all experienced this when we were made new when we knew that Jesus was real he touched our lives and he, he came into our heart and the, and the presence of God was with us you open your life and there is a joy and a hope that surpasses all understanding that changes everything. Everything you view is different. And, uh, and Ananias was who God appointed to, to lay his hands on Saul and open his eyes to the truth. And it would be reflected in, in the physical healing of his eyes. You know, I, I often think when, when Paul, when this happened to Paul, and suddenly from a, a physically blind state to seeing everything again, what did he immediately experience? Were the, were the, I mean, literally, were the colors more vivid? You know what I mean? Like, almost like the old movies where you would have the black and white scene, the Wizard of Oz, you know, that, that blew everybody away because suddenly it went from black and white and you had this marvelous color. And... That, I think, is almost like a, a representation of what life was like before Christ versus what life is like 
with Christ. And here's Paul going to experience this. So Ananias uh, is going to lay hands on him. This, I think it also gives us a, an indicator that laying on of hands has a purpose. This was an instruction by Jesus you, that, he, that he has seen Ananias lay his hands on him. Uh, there's an importance in the laying on of hands. and In many ways, it indicates that there is sort of this supernatural impartation of the Spirit of God which occurs when this happens. You know, when, when we go and we pray over somebody and we, we lay our hands on them and we're, we're just praying that Spirit of God over their life. And, uh, and it has a significant meaning. So where are we at right now with this? Uh, we know that God has, has led Saul right to this place. He, he's going to be in the house of Judas on Straight Street in Damascus at this moment of time. We also see God giving Ananias the direction and the vision to know where he is supposed to be right in Straight Street at the house of Judas, ready to meet with this man named Saul from Tarsus. What would our thoughts be if we came to the realization that God had sent us to do a divine work like this? What, what would we actually be experiencing? If we put ourselves not in, the, not in the mindset of Saul here, but in the mindset of Ananias, the mindset of Ananias. Let's think about this. Think of, you know, somebody who you know is completely against what you believe. And God said, you're going to go to the house of a, of a man. That person is going to be there, and I want you to lay your hands on them and pray for them. Yeah, Jim? I would think when you heard God's voice, any, any, any problem he had with Saul's reputation would be diminished, and he would not question God. And he would say, "Well, this man must be important enough in God's eyes for me to do my what He's requesting me to do." Yeah, that would probably convert him into thinking of Saul. Yeah, I would. I think there would definitely be, I think, that wrestling in our mind. But we're, and we'll read next week that Ananias immediately answered Jesus, Here I am, Lord. But after he sees what God asks him to do, he has a struggle with his flesh also. And I think that's 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 the reality for all of us. Yes. That God asks us to do things sometimes that are going to take us out of our comfort zone that are not going to be our pick for what we do on a Saturday afternoon. You know what I mean? Like, God, you, you really want me to go there? You know, it's, yeah, that guy of all the people. I'll go to every other neighbor on the street, not that guy. You know? And it, it kind of reminds us, it calls back to Moses. You know, when Moses called him, set my, you know, go and set my people free. And Moses like, I don't know. Somebody else, I don't speak well. You know, all, all these different things. But ultimately, we know when we're going to read Ananias does exactly what God has called him to do. And the reality is, here's the truth. God has called each one of us in a specific way, exactly like Ananias. He has a detailed plan and purpose for each one of us to work in his kingdom, to build it up, and he's, he's given us a choice to accept that or to reject that. We, we were listening to somebody just recently and they made, they made a statement that stuck with me. And I, I'm going to, this one I'm going to, I'm going to keep with me. And I want to mention it. He said that the most tragic thing that can happen in the life of a man or a woman is they get to their life, the end of their life having missed their destiny. The most tragic thing. To come, come to the end and look back and, and, and realize that was what God created me for and I missed it. I missed my purpose. 
And I, I, I think that that, that would be the most tragic thing to realize that. So God has a plan and purpose for all of us. We need to seek him, seek his Holy Spirit, and then ask him for the strength to go forward and do it. Because if we try to do it on our own, um, we're going to, we're going to give in to that flesh and we're, we're going to, we are going to miss what he's called us to do. So how about we go ahead and we'll close out and then we will, uh, have a minute or two here for some discussions. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for who you are, and we thank you for your word, and we thank you for your spirit. And Father, I pray now, Lord, that uh, not just here as we have went through this class, but the rest of this morning, this day, and this week, that every single one of us continues to hear your voice. Father, that we continue to hear your guidance and your instruction in all that we do. And Father, may our decisions not be not be based on our flesh or our logic but father may they be based upon your spirit and your wisdom and father may those around us be touched by the presence of you father we thank you we praise you and it's in jesus name we pray amen, amen.